Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak, and thanks to Jenny and Sue, uh, who asked me to come and talk a little bit about the work that we're doing. Uh, oh, here's the remote. Um, so I, for today, I, I thought I'd start at the systems level and then pass it over to Larita to talk about the work uh, that she's leading at Health Leads, and then I'll come back and talk about some discrete work that we're doing around investing. Um, so uh, like Jenny said, I am um, with community and state. I actually lead two areas. One is policy strategy. Um, so in all the markets that we're doing business, in addition to leading uh, some investment strategies, which is really around capital strategies on how it is that we're thinking about investing in communities that we're serving across the country. So what I thought I'd start with, and I apologize for the obligatory SDOH slide that is up on the screen right now, but what I think is interesting about what's going on across the country right now in the Medicaid space is that this is well understood. Everyone has bought into it, right? The health delivery system, the community-based services, Medicaid agencies across the country are bought into this. I think what's interesting that's going on right now is this recalibration of we understand 40% of uh, health outcomes is driven by social factors. So what do we do about it? And I think Medicaid agencies um, in large part woke up to the social determinants because of Medicaid expansion um, and covering individuals, single adults into Medicaid. But right now what's a little bit uncertain is they're compelled to action. They want to drive system reform across the country, and they don't yet know what to do with it. Um, they don't know how to drive the interventions. And then also we're starting to see this interesting recalibration of, as opposed to going after boiling the ocean, everyone with these socioeconomic factors, how does the healthcare system, the Medicaid system, specifically start to scope interventions to individuals whose socioeconomic factors have a very direct correlation to impacting their health outcomes? So we're seeing this play out. I would say in the last, I'm going to make a lot of my comments around Medicaid, but then in the last, I would say four to five Medicaid procurements, social determinants of health is a huge predominant factor in what it is that they're looking from their contractors to participate in. The reality of it is, though, and I love this slide, uh, because <laughs> it really dis really dis beautifully, I think, uh, articulates the complexity on the social services sector. So the federal financing, I, I'll wonk out a little bit. Um, I'm just a firm believer in financing structures. So on the social services side, starts the state, goes down, or excuse me, starts on the federal, right, across six or seven different programs, uh, social services, housing, nutrition, supported employment, that funding goes down to the state, then it goes down to the county, and then it goes down to the delivery system. So as I was preparing for this talk, um, I looked up how many counties there are in the US. It's 3,400 counties. Multiply that by six or seven, call it, different social services streams, then you start to see you've got six to seven systems and then at, within the social services sector. What's challenging about it is that states on the Medicaid side are asking these two sectors to come together. So Medicaid, fee for service, provide the service, you get paid for the service. Social services is predominantly grant funded, block grant funded, bulk service provision and financing. So it's just really representing the challenge it is that we're seeing as states are saying, we're in social determinants, it works. Now Medicaid, start to tackle it. So what, how they're asking us to tackle it it's in a couple of ways. One is assessments and big data. So what we don't know is what are the social factors that are influencing Medicaid beneficiaries. There's different eligibility requirements. Nobody's systematically asking those questions and then pulling that data over to the Medicaid benefit record. So we're seeing a huge focus on Medicaid agencies in this area. Uh, community partnerships is another area. So this is happening in states like Washington, California, North Carolina, where they're actually starting to aggregate um, community-based providers, anchor institutions, social services providers, healthcare providers, and incentivizing them against outcomes to achieve in that community. So we're seeing social determinants as a huge piece of that, including uh, public health agencies. Service navigation is another area that we're being asked to play a role in. So once you identify the need, what are you doing about the need? And that is 
pushing a huge population over into the social services sector that may or may not be able to meet the demands. Uh, alternative payment models, so VBC, big, you know, moving away from pay for services, moving into pay for value. The social determinants is coming into this, mostly I think on the health services side of it. Um, but you're starting to see uh, organizations like ours, like United Healthcare, step forward and start to contract with community-based organizations and driving payment uh, for value. And we'll talk about some of the complexities with that benefits and waivers, they're actually starting to define social services as Medicaid covered benefits, which is opening up a revenue stream for these community-based providers and some of the challenges that are associated with that. But they're only doing it for a subset of complex individuals. So chronically homeless, Washington's done it, Hawaii's done it, California's done it, um, that, are, uh, that they're allowing access for some of these services. But housing, for example, they're not paying for the roof over your head, but they'll pay for all the services that will get you housed. Um, and then population health, that's another big focus area within the Medicaid space. Moving away from outcomes at the individual level, but moving it over into populations is very much the expectation of our state partners. So kind of flipping back to the social services sector, um, I really like this illustration because what it demonstrates is the financial health of the social services sector. Um, in large part, their government contracts aren't enough to pay for their services. They're often filling their financial gaps with additional grant funding. So they're managing against government contracts, multiple awards, multiple grants, um, and it's it's upfront bulk purchasing, right? So they're getting all of the financing um, immediately. What we're finding is, is that 40% um, sit in some type of financial insolvency. Many of them lack the capital infrastructure to reinvest, to participate in this new modern world. Um, and how this plays out at a very uh, kind of specific level is Medicaid defines a benefit, drives a new revenue stream. These organizations don't have enough capital sitting on their books to actually reinvest in things like IT infrastructure, becoming Medicaid certified, being able to bill for those services on an individual level. We've worked with a lot of organizations that have a really difficult time actually even telling you what it costs them to provide services to one individual. And so to participate in that go from this grant funding to this fee-for-service funding structure, um, even though states are creating these new revenue streams, the organizations lack the sophistication to actually tap into those new opportunities. Um, this is particularly true in the healthcare sector underneath these organizations, so housing and shelter that we'll talk a little bit about, uh, mental health and general human services is a very acute pain point for these organizations. So what does it all mean? It's a big old experiment. Um, Medicaid organizations want to do this work. Um, they want to incentivize their vendors to focus in this work. Nobody knows how to do it, and we're all trying to figure it out. And some of us are acting at the community level, some of us are acting at the Medicaid agency level, some of us are directly contracting with these organizations that's creating all of this experimentation and oftentimes um, uninformed interventions because of these big data discrepancies across the system. Um, but what we try to ground ourselves in at the end of the day is why are we doing this? Kind of who are the members that we're serving? Is it the right thing that we're doing? Um, that I always like to bring us back to. Um, it's really important, I think, what we're concerned about is the unintended consequences of these systems being forced together very aggressively through Medicaid reform and how it is that we ensure that we're protecting the financing and the services uh, to support individuals on their journey to health and well-being. So I'm going to pass it over uh, the baton, but I'll be back to talk about um, some discrete investment work that we're doing um, after Loretta's comments. So thank you so much. Uh, my name is Loretta kegler Crawl. I am the Executive Director for the Massachusetts Region at Health Leads. Uh, Health Leads is a social innovation organization that began in Boston at Boston Medical Center 22 years ago. And we began, our founder, Rebecca Oney, began with a very simple concept, to repurpose the waiting room space to be able to better engage with patients to understand some of the underlying essential needs that are affecting their health. 
And so I'm here to talk about Housing to Health, which is a partnership that Health Leads has with Boston Metro Housing and Boston Medical Center and is located in the pediatric clinic at BMC. So it's no surprise to anyone in the room that life expectancy is declining. And we know that many of the factors contributing to poor health outcomes occur in our environment and are due to the social determinants of health, which are the larger issues having to do with racism and poverty that are contextual and impacting people's lives. And I know that you all have probably seen this slide and know these statistics, so I won't uh, go too into detail there. And so there are huge disparities. And when we disaggregate the data and look at the disparities that exist in health outcomes, we see a clear correlation between some of our historical experiences and the communities that are uh, most often experiencing the disparities that we see in health outcomes. And unfortunately, a lot of them are often mitigated uh, by race. And so quite often, when we try to figure out what's, what's going on and, and why are we seeing uh, so much uh, discrepancy in health outcomes for uh, communities that are, are pretty much within good proximity of each other. And, and why is this happening in Massachusetts, of all places, with all of the innovation that we have? Well, we think it has a lot to do with zip code. And I, I am quite certain that folks are familiar with this slide, but it really gets to the, the, cha the, the chasm that exists between some of the solutions that we're trying to implement um, at what we consider very downstream in healthcare settings, where we're addressing the acute needs that we see when folks show up in, in our clinics or our primary care settings. But we don't often have the opportunity to go a little bit deeper and address some of the root causes that are that are are associated with social determinants of health that are institutionalized and systemic. This is, if you haven't seen rents in Boston lately, they're pretty high. <laughs> And as you can see, the discrepancies between what people pay for and where they are um, it's, it's, it's really hard to contend with and understand, you know, how do, what are the solutions and, and how do people um, focus on their health when it's so tough to survive? At Health Leads, we have a, a pretty simple approach. Uh, and, and we believe that it's important to talk to people and to screen. And to screen for what we consider essential health needs. Understanding if people have the ability and the access to um, maintain their housing, to have nutritious meals every day, to get from place to place within their city, to get to work, to pick their children up from school, to afford early education and care. These are all fundamental needs that we consider essential, and that is why we advocate for screening for social needs in healthcare settings. And we advocate. Uh, with our partners. We consider the healthcare system to be uh, not an adversary, but really advocates for best practice having to do with social needs. Uh, Boston Medical Center has been a, fund a, a really cornerstone partner uh, for Health Leads. We began there, and, and we've remained in the pediatric clinic. Um, very Interestingly, uh, Boston Medical Center has realized through their community health needs assessments that housing is a rising, rising need among their most at-risk patients. And not just uh, affordable or safe housing, but many of their patients, one out of four uh, patients who is seen in the pediatric clinic is at risk of being homeless. Uh, and people are in various uh, places in that risk level, but some people have housing and just are not able to afford the rent month on a monthly basis. Some people are at constant risk of their landlord ending their lease uh, in order to uh, turn it into a condo or sell for other purposes. Uh, some folks um, are staying with relatives. Uh, some folks are what we consider chronically homeless. Uh, but for many different reasons, what we uh, expect homeless experiences to consist of are, are, are not um, what we would expect. 
they are many traditional families who are at risk of homelessness, even if they aren't currently homeless when they're in the clinic. And so with that knowledge, we want to be able to um, prevent people's circumstances from worsening with counseling um, that is available at their health care provider. And we've been able to do that uh, with a program called Health to Housing at Boston Medical Center. So in 2018, Metro Housing, which is a, a nonprofit organization that serves over 30 communities in the metropolitan Boston area, providing not only um, the facilitation of subsidy for rental assistance, but also uh, in-depth housing counseling in order to prevent homelessness and also deal with other housing-related um, behavioral health issues. They have uh, hoarding programs and they have all sorts of counseling services uh, for families and for patients. So uh, Metro Housing Boston co-located at Boston Medical Center in the pediatric clinic in 2018. And when they joined the, um, the pediatric clinic, they joined a host of other uh, social needs service providers that were also co-located at BMC, which included health leads. So when uh, Metro Housing Boston came to BMC, we already had in place an established screening and resource navigation system that we were able to welcome them into and also expand the services that we're able to provide uh, to patients out of the BMC clinic. So prior to Metro Housing joining us at the uh, BMC pediatric clinic, we had to do what we called rapid referrals when a patient screened positive for uh, being at risk of homelessness which meant we had no solution. They essentially had to go on a long waiting list for a housing subsidy, which we knew would not address the very urgent needs that were being presented in the positive screen for homelessness. So when Metro Housing joined the social needs team at BMC, we were able to really be able to provide patients with services that we're, making, we're going to make a much more substantial difference than we'd ever been able to do before. Because Metro Housing does not place a limit on the case management that they will provide to patients. So it, it is not limited to time during the visit. It's not limited to six months worth of bundled services. There are no limitations on the counseling and case management that Metro Housing will provide to BMC patients once they enter the Metro Housing Service System through the relationship with the BMC Pediatric Clinic. So it's been a tremendous asset to have the additional services available to address housings with really, patients with really acute housing needs. And what we've been able to determine in, um, in surveying and tracking patient um, outcomes is that the convenience of being able to meet with a housing specialist uh, when they visit BMC for pediatric visit really lifts the burden of having to navigate the um, landscape of social services available to BMC patients. There, there's not a lack of, of social services in the area that is served by BMC, but it's a very complex system for a family that is, is, is stressed and uh, is trying to address their health issues to, to prioritize all of the enrollment procedures, all of the siloed systems and administrators that they would need to interact with in order to stabilize their housing. So being able to uh, have a counselor who is managing that resource landscape navigation is a tremendous um, is a tremendous relief for many patients, and it um, has shown up really in the surveys that we're providing, where patients are are indicating that they feel as though they are better able to manage their health needs because they have a relationship with Health Leads and with Metro Housing Boston through BMC. So Housing to Health um, is, is, is a really great partnership because not only is it beneficial for the families, but it also relieves a lot of the workflow um, confusion, if, if you will, that existed before when the uh, BMC navigators were trying to do the resource navigation alone. 
Uh, having the multidisciplinary partnerships in place on site at BMC has created a much more efficient workflow for frontline staff who are now more knowledgeable about who has the expertise for the specific uh, social needs domains that the patient has screened positive for. And Health Leads has really partnered with both BMC and with Medical Legal Partnership, who is also co-located there, and with uh, Metro Housing Boston to make sure that we have uh, a workflow design in place that is responsive to emerging issues. So we are kind of in communication on an ongoing basis uh, between agencies and really kind of tweaking our workflow system to make sure that we are efficiently addressing patient needs and taking advantage of the resources that we have within the BMC system uh, to make sure patient needs are addressed efficiently. And so our process is pretty straightforward. When a patient enters the BMC Pediatric Clinic, they are screened for social needs. All of our mass health patients are screened for social needs. Uh, at that point, once a positive screen is identified, it's entered into their electronic uh, health record system, and a triage process begins uh, in order to rapidly connect the patient with the resource domain need that is identified. And so that um, service provider uh, who we consider, ad we call them our advocates, will retrieve the positive screen and then contact the patient. And they will begin to um, connect them to the appropriate resources and then begin a, a, a cadence of follow-up to make sure that the needs screened positively for are addressed. And not only that they are addressed for that instant, but that it is not an ongoing problem that represents itself uh, every month. We, do, we work with families around utility shutoffs, with food insecurity, and we want to make sure that these needs that are chronic, that there's a long-term solution in place and, and not just a Band-Aid, if you will. And so the addition of the housing specialist is really that, that missing piece of the puzzle that enabled our program at BMC to be much more efficient. The having to provide patients with a rapid referral was, was really a source of embarrassment for us uh, because we knew that we weren't helping people with a rapid referral. We were putting them on a never-ending wait list. We weren't investing time into counseling services. We didn't have the expertise to really direct them to the resources that they would need to, to avert homelessness. But having Metro Housing join the pediatric team of addressing social needs has made one of our most urgent issues manageable. I don't think I say a whole lot different, <laughs> a whole lot more in this slide. It, it, it is a, a, about the partners working together and, and connecting the pieces and understanding that not only what we do on the outside with external partners and referrals, but the internal systems within BMC that make the co-located partners a part of the workflow for the pediatric clinic are also a big part of the puzzle. And so again, the housing to health case manager um, brings the additional skills, the additional knowledge and expertise that families really need and weren't able to get at BMC or really uh, through health leads before they arrived into the essential needs program. And so these six drivers are what we consider the core changes that really enable uh, effective integration between a social service organization like Metro Housing Boston and a healthcare system like BMC. And so it's within these six driver areas that we really focus most of our change management efforts and provide the kind of technical assistance and support that the uh, care teams need in order to fully integrate the social needs program at BMC. And these are just a, a few quotes, um, because we've really found that the, the patient satisfaction uh, has, has just gone through the roof. Uh, we weren't solving people's most uh, critical problems before we could address housing. And the addition of housing support services is really making a difference in people's lives and their satisfaction uh, with the care that they receive at the BMC Pediatric Clinic.
just a couple of nice quotes about how happy people are now that they're getting great <laughs> case management services. That's pretty much all I got. Thank you. So um, I, I think what you'll see in this next uh, section that I wanted to run through is um, one of the strategies that we've employed at United Healthcare is how do we actually start to scope, identify the great work that's going on in communities, much like BMC and Health Leads and the housing work that they're leading in Boston, but also um, finding those pockets of opportunities in other communities. One of the strategies we've employed is how do we take a capital investment approach and start to think about scaling up those proven interventions, well understood um, work that's going on in communities all across the country, as opposed to us coming in um, in some instances and just contributing to those efforts that are already going on that can create confusion. Um, that's coupled with a programmatic strategy that I know you, uh, everyone knows Cyrus and the work that he's leading at United Healthcare with Dr. Brenner. Um, those two things coupled, right, how do you bring services in when they're not, but also how do you think about capital strategies to start to invest in scale, um, which is what I wanted to spend uh, the second portion of what I'd like to talk about um, with this group today. So. Um, one example of that is an investment that we made actually in Los Angeles County. So um, United Healthcare does business in the state of California. Uh, we actually were looking for ways to meaningfully reinvest in the community. Um, part of the reason why we were interested in Los Angeles was because they had actually seen a 75% increase in their chronically homeless population in the last six years. Um, and they had a severe shortage of affordable housing in many of the urban areas across the country are experiencing this, coupled with a population that had significant underlying conditions, drug addiction, serious mental illness, and they were cycling through the safety net system from the street to the jails, back to the street, um, and didn't have uh, a meaningful system to help, uh, much like what BMC identified, help individuals move from county jails back into the community with rapid rehousing and a housing first model. So I thought it best, if you don't mind indulging, I have a, a short three-minute video from the community partners that we're working with, who I think describe this model much better than I ever could. Uh, so I wanted to show a quick video, really. It's an area where people who have lost hope. Can we walk through, officer? Can we walk through? Yeah. Hey, Raymond, how are you? How are you doing today? It can get really scary. Death is at your doorstep. Somebody's home right here. Right here. We're on Skid Row. You know, there's constant drug use, homelessness. So without, you know, housing and the help that people need, this is what you guys are going to see. Crime rates, death, overdosing, and uh, poor physical health, as well as mental health. Our mission initially was to reduce the number of mentally ill inmates in the Los Angeles County Jail and reduce the number of folks in the jail who were there primarily because they suffered from a substance use disorder. I think it's almost impossible to improve health outcomes when people are living in the street. We can't improve health outcomes until we stabilize people in housing. There's just under 5,000 um, people who are in mental health housing in the jail on any given day. So we have a very big job. You live out here 24 hours and see how you do in the morning. What's up, BMAC? Chilling? There's like a lot of people out there that don't have roofs over their head and they're struggling hard. I mean, they're going through it. Well, I just woke up one morning and, you know what I'm saying? I just decide to have a better life. You know, I said, you know what, I'm tired of going to jail. To me, having a, a roof over your head or like your own place is very important and vital to your health because it's somewhere you can always just, I leave everything outside my door. Like the roots, like the foundation that kind of holds you together. Right. There you go. Oh. <laughs> 
I think for us, Pay for Success is really a way to think about public-private partnerships in a more meaningful way for organizations to really start to think about investing in scaling up proven interventions. I think LA County is just a stellar example of how government, local partners, uh, kind of a public health crisis are all converging and for us to invest in a way to help them scale the solution to impact more people. The innovation of permanent supportive housing has been really revolutionary. There's a, there are a lot of social issues. Not all of them have very clear solutions, but this one does. Permanent supportive housing ends chronic homelessness. You just give a little bit of help, a little bit of investment, and it'll go a long way. Trust me. A lot of happiness, a real lot of happiness. I'm talking about full happiness from head to toe, all day long. All night, every minute, every second, every hour. So uh, what I want to walk through is kind of the thought behind why it is that we uh, chose as an organization to invest in this pay for success. Um, it's actually it's an outcome. The best way to think about pay for success is an outcome based contract, uh, where uh, United Healthcare and the Hilton Foundation actually provided the upfront capital that allowed for them to pay for the services that don't have a revenue stream already attached to them. Um, so what we did was uh, invested $7 million. I believe it was over the term of a five-year investment period. Um, we started that in October of 2017. Um, and we're predominantly measuring performance across two areas. One is housing stability. So can we get individuals housed? Um, and how long do they stay housed? And then there's a recidivism com component to the outcomes that were used as well. Um, preventing individuals from actually touching the criminal justice system was another area that we focused on in the performance measurements. That one was a little bit harder, to be honest with you, because it's extremely difficult to measure uh, the criminal justice touch points. Is it when they're picked up by the sheriff's office? Is it when they're booked in the jail? What's the data that you look at that actually measures those touch points? Um, so that one was an interesting uh, was an interesting one for us to discuss what's appropriate from a performance based perspective. But it was very much a partnership between United Healthcare and the Hilton Foundation to essentially establish the outcomes that we were seeking to measure from an investment perspective. So this uh, this work. Uh, I believe their target is 300 chronically homeless individuals um, that are currently incarcerated in the Los Angeles County Jail that have an underlying chronic condition and they're also chronically homeless that they're actually identifying in the jails and then moving them back out into the community through a series of efforts, not unlike uh, what BMC and Health Leads are doing in Boston. So how did we make the case to invest? So um, part of what we were looking at, because I think uh, pay for success and outcomes-based financing can to some degree be grant funding on steroids, um, where you're basically injecting a, a lot of capital into an initiative. And then once that capital is removed, what do you do? Um, so part of what we looked at in LA was a very deliberate, almost as a part of our underwriting process, looking at the sustainability of the underlying structure with the county to understand how sustainable it was. So a couple things. Um, the county had actually reorganized their agency to pull housing resources underneath Health and Human Services. So they actually started allocating housing resources through a health care lens and identifying those resources through health care needs um, and started to allocate them in that way, which we thought uh, was a very smart way to do it, to ensure the right resources were getting to the right people for the right reasons. The other thing that LA County did is they created a flexible housing subsidy pool. So part of their challenge in LA County is that many individuals that are chronically homeless also have a criminal justice background. And that criminal justice background, felonies, etc., prohibits them from receiving housing subsidies through HUD. 
uh, through other government resources. So LA County actually established a tax revenue funded flexible housing pool that they set aside in LA County. They started it I think three or four years before we did the initial investment um, and they've been growing that housing subsidy pool. I think it started at seven million. It's now close to 50 million that they are financing through um, local tax revenue for the flexible housing subsidies. Um, this was a tested concept. They had actually implemented their model which is identify individuals in the jail then they have a third party that is a fully dedicated entity that will do rapid housing that is seeking um, actually private landlords to allocate some of their units in addition to the permanent supportive housing units in LA County um, and then they're also placing those individuals in a housing first model and permanent supportive housing and then intensively wrapping around case management services, much like what BMC and Health Leads is doing as well. So there's a lot of common themes, I think, with the evidence-based practices. Um, so they had been testing this for about 24 months before our investment period started. So we actually translated their performance into our outcomes-based assumptions related to the investment and performance contract. Um, it was built on a proven model, so permanent supportive housing is fairly well proven uh, that it works uh, in a housing first model as well the robust service intervention model that I talked about, um, and then deep partnerships with the safety net system. So they had deep partnerships with the drug courts, um, with the sheriff's department, with the county jail, um, plus the service providers and the mental health system that really um, demonstrated a robust kind of wraparound support for these individuals. We're also fairly confident that if an individual um, left housing, they would quickly find them through their partnerships with the safety net system and the criminal justice system to hopefully be able to um, bring them back to a period of stability. So we started this work, uh, like I said, I think the initial investment was October of 2017. Um, they've actually housed 202 individuals out of the Los Angeles County Jail. 107 of those individuals have been housed for six months or more, and 27 have been housed for 12 months or more. So, um, and that's essentially right around 90% of their performance goals that we had set forth in the contract. So we're really excited about the outcomes of the work. What's interesting though about it and that we're learning is that so much capital is flowing into Los Angeles County that it has created almost a business of doing homeless intervention and moving individuals into housing. And what's that downstream impact of that has been is that huge stressors on uh, the service delivery system. So mental health access, for example, has slowed. So that access gap is getting larger because the mental health system is so stressed because they're trying to serve as many people as they are through the systematic identification of movement of people back into the communities. So um, it's just an, an interesting tidbit that I think that we we didn't necessarily anticipate through our underwriting process when we were looking at this that um, and uh, it, it's, it is starting to have some impact on individuals getting access to mental health services quickly. And then there's also a shortage of mental health providers in and around Los Angeles County. So um, it's just creating some dynamics um, to pay attention to from a systems perspective. So uh, just a couple quick notes here um, as, as I wrap up, and we wanted to ensure that we left plenty of time for commentary uh, questions and discussion. But, uh, part of what we're doing is taking, uh, shifting the way it is that we're reinvesting in the communities that we serve um, at community and state and taking the social impact lens into what it is that we're doing all the way through our philanthropic grant making uh, funding that we're doing in the communities to have an eye towards social impact. And we're doing a couple things with that work. Um, one is ensuring that we're always contributing to the body of evidence. Um, this goes back to some of my comments as we kicked off uh, the hour, which is around People are there, they're motivated, motivated to move, but they don't really know exactly what it is that they should be doing. And there's not a lot of great evidence that exists. Um, you know, some good evidence around nutrition interventions, permanent supportive housing, I think is fairly well understood related to acute service intervention, but I don't think they really know, we know yet, like what does it mean for 
say, a Medicaid beneficiary that receives waiver services, uh, and what's the impact of the health care cost there. So um, we're always looking to ensure that our dollars are going towards understanding um, that evidence base. Um, we're really seeking to fill capital gaps. Um, oftentimes, this great work to scale up, they can't get financing. Um, they're either considered a startup, um, or maybe they don't have really well-defined revenue streams from a business case. Housing is a little bit easier. We've been investing in the low-income housing tax credits and investing in bricks and mortar uh, for quite some time. But it's the non-bricks-and-mortar, non-asset-bearing services that are really struggling with getting financing right now. And so we think it's really important to ensure that our capital is filling those gaps. Um, and then all of this collectively we want to ensure is informing the policy discussion. Um, I think it's really important. We're at a very interesting recalibration in the health and human services sectors. Um, the more we can help bring, bring to bear evidence to shape that thinking, um, the better off we think the systems will be in, in learning from those efforts. And then the other area that we're really aggressively looking at is societal impact. And much of this, too, uh, with Cyrus and his work uh, that him and Dr. Brenner are leading is really uh, as much a piece of that, which is understanding what is the health impact. We obviously have a vested interest in serving the individuals that we insure at United Healthcare, and we want to ensure that we're always advancing things that are, that are going to impact um, health. And then empowerment and independence, um, I think Emmett, um, very beautifully articulated uh, what it means to be empowered and to have resources and to have a roof over your head um, and how that can impact and give you breath and space to be able to focus on other efforts. Um, we think that that's really important in the work that we're doing, not only in housing but nutrition, uh, the opioid crisis, uh, many other areas that we're actively investing in. And skills development is really important. Um, not only is it important to us in the work that we're doing, states are really um, honed in on this. How do we start to accelerate individuals' skills to be able to um, have a job, maintain a job, maintain housing, be able to live independently, um, et cetera. So we're very much applying these two lenses to all of the work that we're doing and shifting gears on how it is that we're reinvesting in the communities that we serve.